It's a real pleasure to talk, uh, to speak here today. I think that it's it's uh, it's a it's a timely moment, and I have originally was going to talk solely about CRISPR, uh, but because of uh, recent events, I've also including a a recent project on, on COVID nineteen. The my lab focuses on on human genetics, and the the two topics that I'll be talking about are therapeutic editing to cure rare genetic diseases, and that'll be the first story, as well as decoding uh, diseases using genetics, uh, and and in this case, I'll be applying that to the the COVID uh, nineteen. And this always involves really two disruptive technologies, the induced uh, pluripotent stem cells, uh, which, which are, uh, were uh, really developed by uh, Shinya Yamanaka in 2006, as well as the uh, CRISPR uh, technology, which was uh, uh, really uh, decoded uh, by uh, Jennifer Doudna, and she f figured out the way to actually use uh, this uh, amazing tool. And I've been really fortunate to have uh, be very influenced by uh, both of these uh, terrific investigators uh, to to uh, in in sort of in, in my, my studies. And it's the intersection of these two technologies that really drive the research in my lab. So first, I'd just like to start with uh, sort of why use iPS cells. Uh, I, iPS cells really can. The main advantage of them is that they can actually be used to uh, make many, many different cell types that were, were previously impossible. And this is particularly neurons of, say, uh, and I'll talk about peripheral neurons in particular, but all sorts of different types of neurons can be made from them. The retinal pigment epithelial cells, uh, we have a project growing uh, those cells from the iPS cells, and, for, and, and of course the heart cells uh, and the beating heart cells that many of you have seen. Uh, and it's the, the power of growing these uh, in, ones in, in yellow that we grow uh, right uh, in our lab, but also many of these other cell types uh, can be grown and uh, are, are now available to, to do experiments and to really figure out diseases uh, that involve these tissues. So I'd just like to show you a, a one example of, of how these cells have been used and particularly have been used at Gladstone. There's a, there's a cell line, an IPS cell line called wild type C. And this was actually a common, a, a, a control cell line that we developed in our lab. We had wild type A, wild type B, and wild type C. Wild type A, in full disclosure, is actually derived from me. In other words, they were my skin cells that made IPS cells. And wild type A cells are really a horrible cell line, unfortunately, because they don't actually hold their pluripotency. They don't actually, uh, they, they're, they're very, very difficult to maintain. But fortunately, the third cell line, wild type C, uh, was very easy to maintain. And we found that even high school students could actually grow these cells and uh, they would still maintain their pluripotency. So we began giving them out to different collaborators. Uh, with the help of the, of the Gladstone Intellectual Property Office, we were able to distribute them now to over 300 labs around the world. And gradually, uh, and very recently, we've, we've come to realize that this has actually become the world standard. So it's a common platform for human biology as more and more researchers move towards uh, the, uh, towards uh, a, a, a human biology, and particularly these iPS cells, uh, we're beginning to see that actually that all over the world, in, in Europe, in Asia, and, and throughout the United States, people are using these lines. And we're particularly helped by the Allen Institute, who's adopted these lines uh, as their primary uh, uh, type of line. And they've invested over $100 million in actually uh, tagging, putting fluorescent proteins at different parts of the cell and making the, this wild type C even more, uh, more important. Recently, the NIST, which is the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, have actually adopted this cell line as their, uh, as their model system uh, for how, to, how you can edit uh, a, a, a human iPS cell. So this uh, is, is uh, really taking off. I just wanted to show you a few pictures from the, uh, from the Allen Institute just to give you an idea of how powerful these things are. So uh, these are cells which have actually been labeled so that the actually the, the nucleus, the, 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 uh, the envelope of the nucleus is actually uh, labeled with GFP and you can actually see this cell divide right here. And uh, so being able to see a cell renew itself and divide 
uh, while it's living, while it's actually growing, not only as iPS cells, but as, neuro as, as pre early neurons or as, as astrocytes or all sorts of other sites of tissue, very powerful and something that really wasn't possible to do in living cells. And so actually this is the Allen Institute's most, uh, most uh, uh, popular line and, and it has been requested uh, uh, dozens and dozens of times all over the world and people are, are beginning to use it in studies. Furthermore, if you just label the cells, uh, the, car uh, the uh, cardiac myocytes, a uh, particular portion of the cardiac myocytes, you can see these strands here are labeled now with GFP, and you can see the beating is really quite distinct. Uh, whereas if you label a different part of the, of the sa same kind of cell, cardiac myocytes, you see a different, a completely different kind of beating. And so you can immediately look at this and you can tell that just having this collection of cells with the different markings in different parts of the cells really gives you a beautiful uh, way of understanding uh, sort of human physiology in a way that was inaccessible before. Now comes to the two stories that I want to tell. And, uh, and really, and, and CRISPR is an amazing tool for these. And so I'm really going to be telling you about CRISPR, but primarily talking about it in the context of two different stories. Uh, first, I want to talk about uh, motor neurons, and that this is causes a crippling neuropathy. And CRISPR is a potential therapy for this particular type of motor neuron disease. And actually, I'll have, uh, and we'll start with that. And then I'll end with a very new project, which has actually just started uh, really just five weeks ago. Uh, and so we'll just uh, tell you a little bit about, but I think it tells you a nice story about how we can actually, uh, you know, mobilize uh, the technologies at Gladstone and to, to uh, attack this uh, very, very important problem. So, um, so now just as an introduction uh, to the motor neuron disease, I want to I want to actually have a patient uh, introduce it, Delaney Van Ripper, who's, who's a student at uh, UC Santa Cruz, and explaining her condition and the study uh, that she has uh, been, been involved with us uh, in. One of the things that my mother told me that helped me uh, live with it was that everybody has something. There's no normal, there's only average. So like, I don't expect myself to be you know, a perfect human being anymore. I know that I want to have flaws. The other flaws is just a bit more of an obvious flaw than others. She was a very uh, energetic, happy kid. And then right around, right before her seventh birthday, I was sitting there one day and something in my brain switched from being a dad to being a genetic counselor. And this realization came over me immediately. It's like my child's toe walking. And then I immediately asked Delaney to come over to me and asked if she could heel walk, which is where you, you raise your foot up in the air and you walk on your heels like this. And she couldn't do it. And I immediately knew at that point that something was something was going on with her. The most obvious was Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. In your DNA, a gene can go wrong. And when it goes wrong, the proteins that make the nerves don't make the nerves quite right. And for my type, it affects mainly my legs and my hands. And the nerves, because they aren't made correctly, all the signals that get sent aren't sent all the way through. So therefore, the muscles that aren't being used start to weaken, and I can't walk or I can't use my hands quite right. One of the amazing things about motor neurons is that they are the longest cells in your body. And the cell processes they actually start in your spinal cord, and they send out what they call a axon, which goes all the way out uh, to the tips of your fingers and the, uh, and the tips of your toes, and they control your ability for your motor function to happen. What's going on with CMT is that those axons are no longer uh, able to be maintained. So in an interesting way, CRISPR is what led to us here today. I was always studying very basic things, how genes are regulating themselves and things like that. And eventually that led to research on a bacterial immune system called CRISPR. It's a technology for altering DNA sequences in cells, taking the genes out, but also potentially putting genes in, and in principle being able to correct the letters so that now your cells do make the proteins that you need and you have function in your arms. What we're hoping is, is that if we give a treatment right to the spot where these cells live and fix the gene in that cell, that those cells will then uh, regenerate and actually the axons will become healthy and gradually grow back.
So um, now that was the, there was a short clip of a video that was produced by the, by the IGI and uh, the full video will come out uh, later this year. Um, but I, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about how CMT is causing uh, motor neuron disease. Um, your body, uh, in, in your body, for most genes, you have two copies of your genes. You, and in this case, for Delaney, she has a, a normal gene, and then she has one gene, which is actually has the, has the disease as shown in red. And um, this wouldn't seem like such a problem because it's just half of the genes which are defective. Uh, but in fact, uh, these particular type of proteins form uh, a, a bundle, a filament, consisting of hundreds of proteins uh, bundled together. And so uh, even though it's only 50% of the proteins are defective, you can see that all the filaments are going to have uh, some sort of problem and all of the and all the axons are going to have disease, especially the long ones, uh, which uh, are the which go from the spine all the way down to the toes. And so uh, what um, we uh, we hypothesized was that perhaps that if you could delete the disease gene, and then you could actually then uh, de delete this gene, then that only the normal gene would be, uh, would be made, and then the filaments would be made only of healthy neurons. And so the question, of course, comes uh, when, you when you get rid of something like this, um, is, is one copy enough? And in this case, really the power of genetics gives us a great uh, a, a power because the, in fact, we know that there are people that have only one copy and they have completely no, normal neurologic uh, uh, exam. Uh, so they're, they're completely normal. So you really, your body only needs one uh, copy of this uh, particular gene. Uh, and so if we can actually, it's, it's beautiful for us, a nice experiment because essentially ooh, the experiment's already been done in a full person. Uh, and all we have to do now is to do that uh, with, with the CRISPR to delete the diseased uh, allele uh, or diseased gene. And so first we have to grow the neurons uh, from uh, the iPS cells. And so we have iPS cells that we take from, uh, from, uh, from a CMT patient, and then we can actually grow the cells. And then the motor neurons were specific because they're the ones that have to grow all the way from your spine to the tips of your toes. So they make these very, very long processes. And this uh, video is taken only for only 16 hours. Uh, and you can see how much it grows. It actually goes out of the field of the screen uh, during this time and that's because these are motor neurons and uh, they're really trying to actually uh, grow from your spine to your toes here uh, and they're, they're doing so in a plate and they do it remarkably well and we're using very specific molecular biology tricks we can actually uh, get these to, to, to grow um, uh, uh, very well and they really model the, the motor neurons of, of the person. And um, so then what we are able to do is then to try this out. Can we get rid of the diseased allele? And can we get, and then can we actually, uh, can we actually recover it? And the answer is yes, this is the one that is CRISPR. So this is the, the one which is actually, we removed the disease allele. So just going back and just looking at the, at the control here, here's a wild type C again, our, our, our model system. You can see these are normal looking neurons. Uh, they have, uh, this is the cell body. These are these long uh, processes going out. In the disease, there's this accumulation of this disease protein that is shown here in, in, uh, in green. And um, it's not surprising that these cells are, 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 uh, are cause disease and then actually that they don't uh, function normally uh, in CMT patients. Uh, and, uh, but when we take this exact same cell and, or set of cells and actually uh, delete the disease allele, uh, they remarkably go back to uh, the normal uh, uh, looking cells. And so this is very promising to us. Uh, we've got the, we've, we're also inspired by the fact that this is a potential, that is, this has the potential uh, for therapy. And so the next step uh, was that we presented this to the CMT Association, uh, who was enthusiastic about our studies. And they're now funding 
animal studies, uh, so to treat um, mice and rats uh, with this particular disease that have the mutation actually uh, engineered into them. Uh, and so those studies are just now beginning. We're also applying to NIH to refine the IPS uh, editing uh, editing techniques as well as an expansion to other types of diseases uh, because this is really the beachhead for a large number of other diseases and all the data then can be used uh, for uh, to, to really for preliminary data for human uh, clinical trials and so it's this is a long process uh, but uh, but I think we've during this entire time we've been uh, in close touch with our patients and they understand that it's a long process uh, and uh, they're willing to, to wait for something to be safe and I think that at least at this point we, we feel that like it's very much worth uh, the effort and quite excited about the sort of future prospects. So I could have thought, when I was thinking about this, I could have thought about other stories to tell. And I just wanted to tell you about some of those just because some people might have questions about those and I'd be happy to answer them in the question and answer period. We have a pro project for therapeutic editing on a form of dementia and uh, ALS. Uh, and which is C9 or 72, which is really an exciting uh, project and, and moving along well. We have a therapeutic editing program for severe blood disorders for alpha, alpha thal thalassemia, as well as for a retinal degeneration. And this is uh, it called uh, BEST1 uh, is the name of the gene. Uh, and uh, that uh, as well is progressing, as well as new methods for pre precisely editing very large pieces of DNA uh, tens of thousands of, of bases of DNA uh, in a very precise way that's very good for making models of disease and also could be useful for therapeutics. Um, I could have also talked about therapeutic editing of dilated cardiomyopathy and uh, in particular uh, cardiac troponin we have some very nice data uh, with a complete reversal just as I showed you uh, with the CMT. However, it's actually via this cardiomyopathy that we have developed many of the tools to understand how the heart works, how the how heart cells work, and especially how they respond in, in, a, in a plate uh, that got us thinking about cardiomyopathy studies uh, that uh, involved in COVID-19. And so I, I want to tell you about that because I think it's, it's, uh, it's a timely story. It's a very early story, uh, but, uh, but an exciting one, and, and uh, perhaps and I welcome uh, questions about, about uh, all, all of these topics. So it really began um, really at the beginning of now just about six weeks ago uh, that um, Melanie Ott, uh, who is, has the office right literally above me, one floor above me, uh, and she said, you know, I, you've got cardiac myocytes growing and wouldn't it be nice to, I'd be really like to have a have some of those because we're building a facility where we can work with the live COVID virus and we'd like to see if it's infectable. Uh, and um, I actually at that point was uh, kind of unaware that uh, the heart was that involved uh, in uh, the, the COVID disease. It was new, it's new to all of us really at that time. And here is an example though that was, was really one of the early st stunning sa uh, samples where they measured troponin. Troponin is a uh, is actually a protein which is released uh, from your heart and in your blood. And when you have a heart attack, and people say that you have a heart attack or not, they actually refer to uh, your troponin levels. And they were taken in, in, in China, they started to, taking uh, troponin levels uh, from the patients because they noticed their heart wasn't working. And in some of the patients, uh, oh, this group here, you just have very, very high troponin levels, uh, much, much higher than normal. And here in this other group of patients, uh, there were not. And the difference between these two types of patients here is in blue are actually the survivors. Uh, whereas in red, the very high skyrocketing uh, troponin levels were actually from the people who uh, passed away. And so the question became, what was causing this heart disease? What was causing this? And the obvious answer, and the answers that I thought initially were true, was going to be, it's inflammation. There's lots of, you know, there's virus all over. There's got other, they, they're, the immune system is attacking a lot of different things, or maybe it's a vascular thing. Maybe the ve the vessels are are clamping up, and then possibly that there's a direct infection. And I actually didn't think that it was a direct infection initially, uh, but it became clear 
over time that certainly inflammation is involved, but people actually did look at the blood vessels and actually did, did catheterizations, and they didn't see, a, 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 we didn't see any a sign of a vascular disease as, as the primary cause. And the inflammation, it was sort of, the, the amount of disease was, was out of uh, scale for the inflammation as well. And we started digging a little bit further in this and they asked the question, does COVID virus directly infect the heart? As Melanie had suggested, because she was saying, I'd like to infect the heart, your, the, the heart cells that you in your lab with, it, with this and, and see what happens. And so there are no known studies of, of COVID-19 because actually you need a very, very specialized facility, a P3 facility to actually do even do an autopsy. And so autopsies are very rare uh, in, in the COVID-19, unfortunately. Uh, the ACE2 uh, is actually, this ACE2, this is the gene name, is the receptor for the COVID virus and the SARS virus. COVID, uh, COVID virus is a very close relative of the SARS virus, uh, which happened really, really the last time we've had uh, SARS virus was in 2003. Interestingly, cardiomyocytes actually express this ACE2, and it, it, the lungs express it, but actually the levels of expression in the heart were, were very similar as in the lungs, which was to me quite surprising. And then then I found an article that, that was from, from Toronto where after the 2003 uh, SARS outbreak, they actually did pathology uh, on the SARS patients, uh, which, was, which, was, which was really quite a heroic effort because it involved this uh, P3 facility and so on. And in the pathology, they, sh they showed that 35% of the patients who had shown signs of heart failure had direct cardiac infection. Uh, and, and really, this was, for me, a, 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 a realization that perhaps that this deponin levels and the heart failure uh, was perhaps a direct effect on, uh, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the heart and the, uh, the cardiac cells, as, as Melanie was suggesting in the first place. And you've got someone who's uniquely capable of investigating this and seeing and testing whether this is potentially true. We have expertise in the IPS cardiac myocytes, the CRISPR tools to investigate the biology. We are, Melanie's actually, and Gladstone is building a, 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 a uh, rebuilding a facility, a BSL-3 facility, to work on the live COVID virus. And others at Gladstone have, were working on the, a COVID virus interaction map, which was done uh, by the, the Krogan lab uh, at Gladstone, and I'll, I'll discuss on the, this later. But in other words, it's basically a map where the, all the different viruses all the different viral proteins were actually mapped to which, uh, uh, which endogenous human protein uh, was there. So mapping how it interacts with, with the, with the uh, virus. And importantly, we were thinking differently about the problem. When I, I actually asked around about how people were approaching this, and uh, many people really uh, didn't believe that the, the virus was actually in, uh, invading cardiac cells. Um, despite the evidence uh, from SARS, which shares the exact same uh, receptor. Uh, so I, I, we soon realized essentially that, that, that this, was a, this was a problem that really needed to be addressed and examined and to see exactly what was being done. So we developed a, we, we've, we, we've developed a group, and, and the group itself has, has got uh, uh, it was uh, is uh, very energetic, and they really and they developed this that they call the the COVID uh, cardiac COVID team, and it really involves uh, multiple uh, people in my lab and and uh, Todd McDevitt's lab, uh, the Krogan uh, Krogan lab, and then also. Um, I should say, you know, with a good, with inspiration really from, from uh, Melanie, uh, Melanie Ott. Uh, and so uh, this is really, this, this was really a tremendous, uh, you know, it was, it's just fun to actually uh, work with this group because uh, essentially uh, you, everybody is essentially very, very motivated. So the first question is, um, 
will the COVID virus infect the IPS myocytes? And this is something which is still in process. And this because it requires this BSL-3 facility and, and Gladstone is opening soon. And, and uh, this is actually a picture from the CDC, uh, but this is an individual and you can actually see that he has his own filtered air supply uh, and uh, to work with this. And actually it's this mask which is holding us up. Uh, from actually uh, opening up uh, this facility. But the idea here is to take the virus and then uh, infect uh, the cells and then actually to see under what conditions uh, would either block this or, or not. Uh, and, and particularly uh, you know, by altering potentially the, the AC2 uh, receptor. So, so these are ongoing and we've been part of now uh, contributing to the, uh, the building of this, uh, this uh, equipment to the uh, to the process, as well as planning experiments uh, for that. What's easier to get started with right now is sort of is to, to think about the protein internet active uh, action net, uh, network, uh, and this really needs to be repeated in cardiac myocytes uh, to find the cardiac specific drug targets. Nevin Krogan, a Gladstone investigator, uh, and uh, has ha and developed actually did a, a, a and down here. It actually shows the the, the paper that they uh, published, and here's the New York Times article where it basically they said scientists identify 69 drugs to test against the coronavirus. They identified these drugs because what they did was actually identify. Uh, took uh, viral proteins as shown here in red and then found all the interacting uh, proteins uh, with them. And then, uh, then there were drugs which affected some of these and then so those became potential drugs to interfere with the viral life cycle. All these studies were done in the proteomics facility on the second floor of Gladstone, uh, which incidentally, actually, when it's um, going at full force, actually uh, uses about 20% of the electricity of the Gladstone building. So it's really, uh, it's, it, this, is, this is a powerful uh, facility, both scientifically and, and in terms of electricity that it uses. Um, and so the idea here is that we're going to be able to uh, now take um, and repeat this study. This study was done in a fibroblast cell line, a cell line which is not a cardiac cell, not a lung cell, um, but an easy cell to work with. And uh, now to repeat that in cardiac cells, which are much harder to work with, uh, but much more clinically relevant. And then uh, other groups are working on doing this, of course, in lung cells where the, the primary infection occurs. And so uh, viral proteins are already being expressed. Now we're just a few weeks later and uh, there are 27 different viral proteins and uh, they're listed, they're, they're, I just listed them by number rather than by name. Uh, and then one protein at a time are expressed in cardiac myocytes. And this is a cardiac myocyte expressed uh, protein and as well as the green fluorescent protein. And then we're asking the question, is there cardiotoxicity? Is there a sign for this particular, and this particular one, there's really no sign of, of, uh, of it's eating apparently normally, but later we can also stain it and look for signs of, of abnormalities. And then we can identify binding partners uh, just as Nevin Krogan did, but now for the cardiac myocytes, because obviously those partners could be quite different, and we want to know uh, what those uh, what those are, because that could be a therapeutic target, specifically for the for the deadly heart disease. So our overall central hypothesis is that COVID nineteen deaths are some of them are due to the cardiac infection. Remember, most people. Uh, be, it begins as a lung infection, and most of the time it stays in the lung and the heart stays healthy. And 99% of the time, people actually get better just with their lung, uh, with, with, the, with the lung infection. We believe that actually that one of the key uh, areas uh, for increasing in severity is when it jumps uh, to the heart. And uh, this occurs in, in, in at least, in, it, it doesn't occur all the time. In fact, we they think it occurs in the minority of the time. But when it does, it's utilizing the same receptor. There's the ACE2 receptor, which is, uh, it, uh, is, is now, um, is, is the same receptor in the lung as also in the heart. And there are other tissues that express the ACE2 receptor that also have 
uh, signs of infection as well. I shouldn't say the heart's the only one, but this is the, certainly the one which is perhaps the most deadly. Uh, and then finally, I think the, then this raises a number of research questions. How do we stop the spread of the COVID virus uh, to other organs and particularly to the heart? Can we, for instance, downregulate or inactivate this ACE2 receptor? There are people who are, are, are working on drugs, actually. There are several drug companies that are working on this, uh, but we want to actually identify drugs which are actually not, are already in the public domain uh, that may actually uh, decrease the ACE2 receptor. And I think that that's actually quite possible because this receptor is, in fact, very uh, highly regulated. So I think that this is, uh, this is actually an attainable goal in a, in a relatively short period of time. But once the infection actually occurs, once the infection occurs, it's already in the heart. How do we protect the heart uh, from these toxic uh, viral proteins? And, um, and, it's, and it's here where those protein-protein interactions uh, and with uh, that, uh, where we, if we can identify specific ways that it's interfering with heart function, uh, perhaps we can actually understand how better to maintain uh, the, the people and get them over uh, this, uh, this very, very uh, difficult part of the disease. So in summary, I've talked about uh, CRISPR and uh, genetic disease and uh, COVID-19. I think that uh, we've, we've talked about two stories, the motor neuron disease and, and, the, and the, the COVID-19 in the heart. And these, are really, these, are, these iPS cells are really amazing tools. This CRISPR and iPS cells potent tool together for decoding disease and, and potentially curing some. And so we're, I just want to convey some of the excitement that we have uh, in, in, in uh, doing that.